Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Butzel Long's webinar, The Big Three Automakers Suspend Operations, The Legal Effects on the Supply Chain. During this morning's presentation, please feel free to submit any questions you might have to the presenters using the GoToWebinar control panel. Our presenters will answer as many questions as they can at the end of the webinar, time permitting. Also, a copy of this presentation will be made available this afternoon on the Butzel.com webinar event page. With that housekeeping out of the way, I would like to introduce Butzel Long shareholders, Sheldon Klein, James Bruno, and Jennifer Dukarski. Sheldon? Good morning, everybody. Um, you know, when, when the introduction was made, I realized that our title was already obsolete because we talk about three automakers. And as of this morning, uh, we understand BMW, Honda, Hyundai, Kia, Nissan, Toyota, Tesla, Subaru, and VW are shutting down. And in addition, Mercedes has announced it's probably going to shut down for part shortages. Uh, if I'm not missing anyone, that's the entire industry. Now, if, if, if you were comfortable that all of this will last only a week or two, you probably wouldn't be joining us this morning. But well over 100 of you have registered. Uh, which is a pretty clear sign to me that this isn't going to quickly blow over. And, and it's not simply that you'll get a nice, relaxing week at home, sheltering in place, and then back to work. But this is going to be a problem we're wrestling with for a while. So we're going to we're, we're going to look into what this means under your, your supply chain contracts up and down the um, supply chain. John is being balky for me. It's a, no, there it goes. Forgive me. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is do the OEMs have the right to stop buying because of, of this virus? The, the, the answer is yes, at least assuming that you are under a requirements contract and for production goods, the vast, vast majority of contracts are requirements contracts. The, the answer derived from the UCC section 23601 sub one, which makes requirements contracts enforceable. And I'm gonna give you about 15 seconds to read the, um, let me read the quote. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse or not when I'm pointing to it, but it's the second bullet. Um, and, and I'm going to guess that all of or many of you will have the same question after you read those words. That is, it, it says that the re requirements can't be unreasonably disproportionate to any stated estimate. And it sure seems like zero is disproportionate to the 500,000 units that you were promised or estimated or, or whatever it was. But that's not the way the courts see it. The, the courts see that if a buyer has zero requirements in good faith, they have zero requirements and no obligation to buy anything. The unreasonably disproportionate language is a ceiling, not a floor. And in, in, in a, it's a ceiling, it says your customer can't demand unreasonably more goods from you than you have reason to plan for, uh, can't can't demand more than you have tools for, more than you have lines for, et cetera, but it's not a floor at all, zero is zero. In addition to the basic nature of requirements contracts, it is possible that this is a force majeure event, which would allow them to not proceed to purchase even if they otherwise had an obligation. Now, it's really an interesting and complicated question as to whether a plant closure for reasons of employee safety or employee morale is a force majeure event. After all, the government has enforced the, the OEMs to shut down. It's not impossible for them to keep their plants open. And they, they have a very good reason for shutting down, but that doesn't mean it's a force majeure reason. Now, as with most interesting and complicated questions, we leave those for Jim Bruno. He's going to talk about force majeure after I'm done talking, and you'll get the, the answer, or at least his thoughts, 
as to how, how force majeure lies, applies here from the OEM's perspective. And forgive me, I'm having some significant lag here and moving the slides, I assume eventually there ago. So what about firm releases? They're supposed to be firm, even if it's a requirements contract, uh, there, there's some portion of your obligations that are denominated as firm. The answer is going to depend on the specific language of your contract, but virtu under virtually all contracts in the industry, certainly all OEM contracts, uh, the, the buyer, the OEM has the right to defer any specific, specific delivery. You see specific language for FCA, Ford, and GM. I could have found similar language in any of the other OEM's contracts, which effectively mean that firm doesn't mean firm date. If, if, if they say we don't want it today, we want it three weeks from now, they have the right to do it. Now, does that mean there's never an obligation to buy the firm releases? They can put it off perpetually? Uh, well, conceptually, probably no. You would read a reasonable time into uh, the deferral or the suspension, or whatever reasonable might mean. But as a practical matter, it really doesn't matter because when the customer finally resumes purchasing, hopefully soon, its, per its first purchases will effectively be of the firm releases that it rescheduled when it suspended purchases. Um, so the, the notion, at least for these purposes, the notion that there are firm releases doesn't mean a whole lot. So what about your contracts with your suppliers? In general, the analysis is the same. Uh, you know, we, we framed the initial slides in terms of OEMs and implicitly tier ones, but the answer isn't different if it's a, con if it's a requirements contract between a tier one and a tier two. Um, the, 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 the limitation on that is it is going to depend on your contract. And if your contract with your supplier doesn't line up with your cost contract with your customer, you can be wind up holding the bag. In, in, in other words, you've made promises to your customer that you haven't demanded from your supplier. And if there's a gap between the two, you're caught in that gap. Now, this is just as a basic of sound contracting in the supply chain you really should make sure that your terms of purchase avoid that, that, that make it clear that your supplier is obligated to your customer to the same extent uh, as you are, so that if there's a problem, uh, they don't get to escape. Now, it's surprisingly hard to do it. It's, it's one of the more complicated drafting challenges, I find at least. Uh, it's often poorly done, but it, it, Whenever you have some time, whether it's now or sometime in the future, and you're thinking about revising your terms, uh, that might be something you want to think about, and it might some, might be something you want to talk to a lawyer about. But again, it, it's it's tricky. So, what about ramping up and ramping down? I think I may have. I know I skipped a slide. Forgive me. Um, we talked about requirements contracts. What about non-requirements contracts? There are non-requirements contracts in the industry, especially for non-production or commodity goods. You, you promise to purchase X barrels of lubricant, lubricant for delivery on March 25. That's a, a, a firm promise. It's not dependent on anyone's requirements. And unless your contract says differently, you're obligated to take and pay for, or at least pay for that lubricants, unless you have a force majeure excuse. And again, um, Jim will, will address the force majeure aspects of this. Now, this, this can be a non-trifling problem. 
if you have a long-term contract for purchases of, of tons and tons of tons of resin or steel, um, and your requirements for those don't go, go away for some meaningful period of time, and your contract doesn't address that problem, you are probably going to have to sit down and work something else, work something out with that supplier. Um, it, it's simply not true that as a matter of contracting law, you can say, well, it turns out I didn't need it, so I'm not going to pay you for it. Now on to ramping up and ramping down. Uh, there's obviously a variety of costs that you will incur, have incurred in ramping down production. There's storage, there's maintenance, there's lots of other things. Subject to the contract itself, and you know, all of these are problems that could be and perhaps should be addressed through sound contracting. But if the contract doesn't address it, you probably cannot recover those costs. Stated differently, if the customer has the right to stop buying, buying, it's not obligated to pay you for what would probably be labeled incidental costs of ramping down. What about when you have to resume operations? You can't go from zero to 60 on two hours notice, even though sometimes OEMs expect that of you. Do you have a problem? Are you entitled to reasonable lead time? Well, FCA expressly says, says yes. Um, the, the language is quoted in the slide. I, I won't repeat it. Uh, the other OEMs, or at least the other, the two others of the Detroit Three, I confess I didn't go and check the various foreign automakers, uh, don't address it express, expressly. However, there are doctrines of usage of trade, course of dealing, course of performance, and also good faith, uh, which provide a sound basis, though not a certain basis, for you to be able to say, everyone understands that's the way it's done in the business. Everyone understands that even though the contracts of Ford and GM act as if the whole concept of lead time doesn't exist, everyone understands that it's fundamental to the supply chain. And you should read into every contract that any demand for goods assumes provision of a reasonable lead time. It's possible there may be some interesting, uh, interesting litigation that arises out of that point. Uh, obviously, for a lot of reasons, and will vary from part to part and supplier to supplier, but it can take a long time to get everything's cranked up and, and rolling smoothly once we get back to normal or whatever the new normal looks like. I assure you, I'm waiting for a lag. I haven't fallen asleep. Okay, I'm just going to close with some very high level best practices and then hand it over to Jim. It is whatever the problem, the first bullet's good advice. Know your contract. Don't assume that it'll all just be worked out happily through commercial discussions. Um, and if you don't know your contract, you may lose the right to enforce your legal rights because you don't assert those legal rights promptly. As with any disruption situation, any crisis situation, communication is really key. Strongly encourage you to have a principal place point of contact for every one of your significant customers, for every one of your significant suppliers. Uh, so things don't get lost in, in a long, long telephone chain. Uh, you need to know what's going on. To the extent you can, identify potential ramping up bottlenecks uh, in the system and try and address them up front. Talk, talk up front with your customers and your suppliers about who's going who's gonna to pay for air freighting or for paying a labor uh, a, a labor premium to run three shifts or whatever the, the case may be. There's lots of potential incremental costs. If you can deal with them ahead of time, um, it, it makes, you know, sometimes it makes it easier than fun fighting about it later. Sometimes the best decision is to worry about it later. Um, and, you know, in addition to costs, 
address schedule relief and any other sources of problems that you might have. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Jim to talk about force majeure. Well, good morning, fellow shut-ins. This is Jim Bruno, and uh, we have a diverse group in their audience today. There are uh, a good percentage of lawyers, so some of our some of our discussions will be involving some t technical aspects of the law. Uh, the majority of you are not lawyers, so we're going to, again, as always, try to provide a, a balance to the guidance for the practical considerations as well as the uh, the legal considerations. Um, we all talk about force majeure, and this is really basically force majeure, a, a, a very short uh, description of it, um, it, it, so that we have a basis for going forward in analyzing uh, what is occurring now across the industry with the uh, shuttering of the, uh, of the plants. So you're probably aware, but let's just do some basics here, that force majeure is a French term meaning superior force. It's not used in the commercial code. Um, because the code uses a different term called impracticability, which is uh, very similar, uh, but um, it's a broader term uh, than possibly imp impossibility. So it doesn't have to be impossible uh, to become protected or a force majeure event under the code as being impractical. But many of our contracts continue to use the term force majeure in the contracts. Not all of them. You'll see some of the uh, terms and conditions get away from using that uh, particular term. But because the UCC allows for freedom of contract, uh, any analysis of excused or delayed performance requires you first review your specific force majeure clause in the contract if you have them. And then second, to the extent that the force majeure clause is not a complete statement of all of the issues relating to force majeure, then you can look for the UCC for any fillers of any gaps uh, relating to what uh, should happen under the law if a force majeure event occurs. Now, there is the legal question for you attorneys out there as to whether if there is a force majeure clause in an integrated contract, does it exclude the additional application of UCC 2615, which is the, uh, the impracticability clause, or does the UCC actually supplement the force majeure clause and add additional comments or perhaps interpretations? Uh, of course, not all contracts, including terms and conditions, have a force majeure clause. For example, FCA does not have a specific force majeure clause. And when you're dealing with FCA, you would then default to the Uniform Commercial Code's relating, you know, provisions relating to impracticability when a force majeure event occurs. Uh, there's also the possible supplementation of, these, of the force majeure clause in the contract by uh, the common law. Uh, and other sources of law. But basically, you go to the contract and see what it specifically says about force majeure. Uh, and uh, I'm having the similar issue as... Uh, as we slip down here, so let's... I am having a little trouble able to change from the first one. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it, I, it, I went too fast, so let me go back a ways. There we go. Now we're working. Okay. Um, so, again, because the contract terms control, um, you must read your contracts. Uh, I know that um, Sheldon has already stressed this, but you cannot stress it too much. You, you have a contract. You can't rely on your gut feel. Um, you must go and read them. And, again, think about what you learn when you read them, because the next time you negotiate a contract, you realize that your force majeure con provision has more importance than uh, you thought. And again, because of this, you should also be thinking about your insurance coverages. I'll be talking about insurance in just a moment. So, so selected key issues to examine when you're in your contract. 
um, is the specific event such as an epidemic or some disease, is it mentioned specifically as being included or excluded by the clause? You also need to think about in your contract, what is your INCO term? Because your INCO term determines your point of delivery and the point of delivery is important in determining whether you are late in performance. So whether you are delivering X works or DD, DDP buyer makes a huge difference in what mitigation and other related costs you need to bear in order to get your goods to the point of delivery. Also you need to determine in the force majeure clause, what type of notice do you need to give in order to take advantage of the clause? You need to look at your terms and conditions to determine what law applies, because if we're all international, and if the UCC does not apply, does the Convention on the International Sale of Goods apply? Are you dealing with Canadian law, German, German law, Mexican law? Um, we do have an alert relating to the Chinese law. So if you're looking for discussion of force majeure in Chinese law, let me know. And then what other obligations are imposed by the force majeure clause? For example, what type of actions do you specifically need to do in the event that either a force majeure event has occurred or you, you may be forcing it? There's enough information that you have that you should be planning for it. For example, building a bank of parts. You cannot ignore not only what has occurred to you, but what might be occurring based upon the facts available. So assuming you are faced with a force majeure event, you have to take reasonable action to mitigate or diligent action, or do you have to do whatever it takes in order to avoid the effects of the force majeure clause? The fact that you have a force majeure does not mean that you are removed from any duty to do anything and just rely on that force majeure event. And then of course, you have to look and see what are the buyer's rights? Does it have the right to cover by purchase from others or does it have the right to terminate? For example, if you look at the Honda terms, um, you see that the first part delay, they don't use the term force majeure, they use excusable delay. And so that means that to the extent that there's been a delay from something that wasn't your fault and then react and, and results, as you'll see from these specific events, acts of God, acts of war, et cetera, that then you may have a force majeure event. But, and it's nice because if you look down at the last line and say it's delays of similar natural or government, this means that this is a catch-all or a basket clause, which means that just because you don't have the specific event occur listed, it doesn't mean that it doesn't uh, that, that you cannot come under the force majeure provision. But just as it lists what is included, if we get to the next slide, you'll see it lists then what is not excluded. So um, you need to read the terms, your force majeure term very closely and determine whether or not you've got uh, relief. So is the uh, coronavirus a force majeure? Um, it, it is likely to be a force majeure event someplace. But if the coronavirus event occurred in China, that does not mean that you as a supplier here can automatically rely on the fact that your sub-supplier or your fourth tier of, uh, experienced a coronavirus force majeure event. Uh, there are many um, indications that the, back in China, it was a force majeure event, but is it here? Now we know about the epidemic as it spreads, that it may become a force majeure event here, but you cannot rely on the fact that originally in China, it was a force majeure event. So what does this mean? All right, I haven't been put in isolation. I'm still waiting for... Uh... Okay. So basically what this means, if you look at this chart, starting up at the top box, um, okay, um, on that chart, 
um, you have to be able to trace uh, the uh, force majeure event and down through all of your the supply chain so that it may have experienced it in Wuhan, but then you have to say, along the way, could steps have been taken that would eliminate it? So if you took positive steps, either the Chinese subsidiary, the U.S. supplier, or the U.S. supplier, if you could do actions such as working overtime, putting on an additional shift, could you have mitigate, mitigated or corrected and caught up from the delay that may have occurred in China? You owe that duty to mitigate. Um, okay. So who bears the cost? Uh, this uh, reinforces uh, what Sheldon was saying, that there's two models, binary or equitable. Binary, if, if there's uh, no really excuse that the supplier is liable for the damages. Uh, if there, in other words, if there's no force majeure and you're just late, of course, you pay for all damages. It's a, it's a breach. But if you have a force majeure excuse, the costs stay were incurred. So again, emphasizing this point, uh, you bear the cost of bringing your delivery schedule back on track. Um, there's some, again, some other laws, if you have contracts based on uh, other legal systems, the rule may be different. So again, the idea is to um, think about uh, how you can reach an agreement. Um, and of course, if you're, uh, you may be able to have a claim against your other suppliers. So let's look at the OEM closings relation to force majeure. Force majeure is a superior, superior force that prevents practical performance. The current situation does not prevent the OEM from purchasing and using your goods. The closing is a result of an agreement with the unions and concerns for safety. There is no union walkout. Uh, you know, they did not th really threaten a wildcat strike. It was through negotiations. The closings at, at the non-union plants are, are concerns for worker safety. There's no government order to close except possibly at Tesla in California. And for a while, Tesla uh, it sort of ignored the order. Um, but now, since there is a real threat to workers' health, but there is no proof that it could not be addressed through other means while production continues. Some of you suppliers are continuing through other means of mitigating the possible uh, contagious uh, effect of the, of the illness. Thus, the big three would have a difficulty in proving a, um, a force majeure event. If it's not a force majeure event, what is it? Well, is it any different for suppliers than a changeover in midsummer or a Christmas vacation? Well, one, <laughs> the answer is yes, it's different. One, it's unscheduled. B, there are additional unexpe unexpected costs and risks and there is no definitive end. So we can, if in fact, as Sheldon was saying, if we really believed that this was gonna end in a week or two, uh, we wouldn't have much cause for even attending the seminar. But because we know that those notices say, at least some of them do, at least until the end of March, we have to be concerned. Since there is, there is no claim of either force majeure or impracticability because the OEMs don't want to admit that the coronavirus is an FM impractic or impracticability, as that could be an admission that could be used uh, against them later. Um, but for example, um, the, the, an example of the force majeure in GM says, if the buyer is unable to accept delivery, buyer use, uh, as directly as a result of an occurrence beyond reasonable control without such a party's fault, then they're able to um, take action. So they could try to use force majeure, uh, but instead under four, as you see there, the OEM claim rights under capacity and lease provisions in the terms and conditions and other documents as Sheldon's explained. The OEMs could also claim rights under termination for convenience. So what insurance coverage may be applicable? 
Well, there are different add-on riders to your basic business insurance policies. Those include coverages such as business interruption, contingent business interruption. That basically means that there's been an interruption at your supplier or their civil authority uh, rider. Uh, And if these are enforced, they may cover your lost income. Uh, But you need to carefully look at those policies to determine what are the specific inclusions and exclusions. And oftentimes these policies, and you'll hear this from the insurance companies, they require direct physical damage to the to your property or your supplier's profit, property if it's a CBI policy that's required to trigger coverage. But the arguments are developing that an actual viral infection or maybe a well-based fear may be physical damage and may be enough to trigger coverage. A closing caused by a sustained order or limited access could trigger, trigger coverage under the civil authority rider, such as occurring in California now. So you need to check your commercial policy for riders. Uh, we are trying to, uh, we're all sticking to uh, 15 minutes so we can leave enough time in the hour for questions. But I want to point out to you that uh, I have uh, expanded the, the list that uh, um, Sheldon started. So these are a, a, a lengthy list of best practices when facing a force majeure. And then uh, if you are faced with your own force majeure, here's a template for um, a letter that you might consider developing to give notice of uh, the force majeure event that you are facing that you would uh, send to your customers. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jen. Thank you very much. And we'll be talking again in the question and answer session. Jen? All righty. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those of you who are in the EU. Um, I'm going to hopefully pray to not have lag time, but uh, if I do, again, our apologies in advance. You know how it is working remotely and, and with all of the struggles that we're facing. I'm going to shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about two things. First off, I'm going to talk about the Defense Production Act. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what the future might look like. So let's start with the Defense Production Act. If you've had the opportunity to to read more business-oriented news, you'll know that on the 18th, that was a mere two days ago, Wednesday, uh, President Trump invoked the concept of the Defense Production Act. Now, this act, um, is its intention is to promote industrial resource preparedness in the United States. And at the time, Trump noted that he wants to make sure that the country is ready uh, to handle any global disruptions in the supply chain, and particularly with respect to the supply chain in the healthcare field. So what is this Defense Production Act? Now, the Defense Production Act, and it's 50 USD sections, 4,500 at SAC, but uh, it requires, and and I take these words, they're directly in the statute, it requires uh, acceptance and the performance of contracts when the president asks to be able to allocate materials, services, and facilities that the president deems necessary to promote national defense. Now, the president can't just invoke this without reason, and again, the two situations that are required are first, scarcity of critical resources and requirements that could not be met without creating a particularly huge dislocation in the normal distribution channels. So when we look at the situation today, we know that many healthcare sources and authorities suggest that we will be out of masks, respirators, and ventilators as early as the beginning of April. Seeing this, the president in theory could invoke the Defense Production Act and mandate, require acceptance and performance of contracts or orders that he issues to produce these particular products. But it's not just that. The Defense Production Act is a little more broad. It also has a section that prevents hoarding for the consumption of goods. And and this is both on a consumer, commercial, um, and a, a home level. Believe it or not, in theory, you could look at the act and you would see that the president could publish in the Federal Register the number of toilet paper rolls that a home could buy. Um, Unlikely that he'll go to this level, but that actually is part of the Defense Production Act. Failure to comply, if a business is asked to to jump in and assist, failure to comply could lead to fines and penalties, including $10,000 in one year 
imprisonment. There are provisions for wage and price controls, but these actually require a joint resolution of Congress. But the nice thing about the Defense Production Act, it's not all punitive. Even though it does have the $10,000 one year in prison, it does have the language of mandating the performance and acceptance of contracts. It also provides for a reliable source of supply. It also allows the guarantee of loans, the provision of loans, and it helps from the standpoint of providing additional resources for businesses to make this transition. It also seeks to, to promote small businesses. So truly, the Defense Production Act, which was born out of the Korean War to try to strengthen our industry and the ability to produce necessary goods, is a carrot as well as a stick. So how far does the act go? Now, the, the president mentioned it on Wednesday. He sort of withdrew that, I guess, uh, excitedness yesterday when he said he saw that manufacturing was stepping in. He saw that Ford and GM had consented to the idea of looking into producing ventilators. So he said on Thursday that he's not necessarily going to invoke it unless he needs to. But if he needs to, how far does this act go? The first question is, could I be forced to produce? Probably, or more along the lines of truly possibly. Um, there is one case that held that the DPA is indeed constitutional, um, but I'll say that with a caveat. If you are a, a manufacturer, for example, of steering products, it's highly unlikely that, that the president would sweep in and tell you that you now must make hand sanitizer. Um, it, it's unlikely that that type of a situation would ever occur, but in theory, the, the way the act is established, it is indeed possible that you may be required to accept contracts and to produce under them. Now let's take a look at what happens on the back end. Um, let's assume that a, a product causes harm to someone. Would the government indemnify me, even if the government is the one providing the specification? Likely not. Um, there is Hercules Inc. versus the United States um, the, this was a claim where the manufacturer produced Agent Orange, and they didn't create it, they didn't specify it, but they sought indemnification after the fact for products cases. In this case, the DPA was not a basis for an indemnification claim. So under the DPA, it's unlikely that the government will indemnify. And further, for the loss of other contracts, it's unlikely that the government would compensate for the loss of other business. Um, the government required Kearney and Trekker Corp to expedite delivery of a machine and provide it to the government. This had frustrated the sale to a third party, so the, the folks at Kearney brought it to the uh, government trying to seek compensation. The court found that there was no taking under the Fifth Amendment, and it was just a, a frustration of expectations. So in that case, the government didn't provide any additional remuneration to Kearney and Trekker. So as this happens, if, if indeed this is invoked, you have to be careful on both ends because the, the government may be able to require you to produce certain products, but on the back end, it's unlikely that any of the claims that are there, the government will necessarily compensate you for. So what does that future look like in the instance that either the, the DPA is invoked or if we start to diversify? So when General Motors becomes General Ventilators, we've got a new normal. At that point in time, you'll have to ask yourself a couple of business questions. Business question number one is, what is our role in this new diversified supply chain and do I have one? Uh, and second, will the OEMs ever restore production levels? Uh, the question will be if GM gets into the ventilator industry and decides to remain there and only restore a portion of their production levels, and we don't get back to the 2019-2020 levels, what's going to happen then and how does our business model change? And truly, they are more business decisions. But we need to understand, even if we do shift, even if we do diversify, there are traditional legal issues that are arising. Um, if you're in that mode of diversifying, you'll find that IP disputes are still highly active. Uh, in Italy, there were volunteers who were 3D printing valves, uh, and the valve manufacturer had threatened um, patent litigation 
based on the fact that they were 3D printing their, their very expensive valve. Uh, state Consumer Protection Acts have been invoked. Uh, here in Michigan, uh, Dana Nessel has sent out cease and desist letters uh, to a few different places. Other states, including Georgia, have started looking into deceptive advertising and unfair competition. So if you do decide to diversify, you need to be prepared, particularly if you're going into the healthcare industry, but even if you go into other avenues, uh, you need to consider some of the intellectual property risks. Again, it's um, not expecting anyone to, to go and be those guys who 3D printed um, different products, but you need to make sure that you look into the intellectual property rights of any technology that you're working with and, and proper licensure of that tech. You want to consider end user liability risks. Um, within the last two weeks, personally, I've been incredibly busy helping manufacturers ramp up and make the change over to produce um, to produce products in the healthcare industry, um, aside from being um, in the automotive fields currently. And really, those risks are indeed different. The question might be, how do you handle a situation where you were once producing a widget and now you're producing component parts or of, of systems that will go into respirators, ventilators, or you're making the masks themselves? Are you willing to warrant that you're going to protect against COVID? Um, are you meeting all of the regulatory requirements that may be required by the FDA? Are you sure those FDA requirements are still valid? And further, the contractual risks. As we talked about earlier, if the DPA is invoked, the government is not necessarily going to have your back in the case that problems do arise. So looking at those contractual provisions has been absolutely critical and will be critical as you go forward if you do diversify and move into this particular healthcare field and arena. So thank you, and we're now going to shift over to some Q&A, and um, I think I am the one who's getting some of the Q&A kicked up, so bear with me while I turn to some of the questions. Uh, the first question, regarding releases, we built products to customer releases, but they announced the ramp down and then did not send the truck pickup uh, to pick up the material and they have left it on our docks. What options do we have? I, I suppose that's directed in the first instance, at least to me. Um, in, in part, I, I would think, and I invite Jim's thoughts, it would be a question of shipping terms, at, at which point do the ownership of the goods transfer in a really hyper-technical way of, of, of looking at um, beyond that, and beyond looking at your contract to see exactly what was promised, you may be stuck with those goods. Now, again, if you can sell the same goods two weeks from now, if it's not raw fish or uh, bananas, um, you know, it, it may be a relatively modest problem, which relatively modest to me is probably not relatively modest to you. Um, but other than looking at your contract, assessing shipping terms, and thinking about it practically, there, there's no great answer that I have. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Sheldon, uh, can you hear me? I can. Okay, yes, um, and Sheldon mentioned uh, shipping terms uh, and your right to payment. Uh, if your right to payment depends upon the pickup, then uh, of course you, uh, you really don't have the right to invoice. Um, however, if you're, um, if, if your uh, shipping terms are X works and you've tendered the goods um, a, um, at the at the site, um, you're going the the customer's not going to agree with you, but legally may have a right to uh, claim that there is uh, an, a right to bill for them, and if the billing is not paid, uh, to collect interest on the uh, unpaid invoice. Uh, but other than that, um, you can look to see if your firm release really does, it really is firm, meaning that they cannot change the firm uh, period, the, the, the firm period, and they have to pick up what's in the firm period, uh, then you can have a claim, but I doubt that you're going to make it. Um, you, for one thing, uh, if all you've done, if all they've done 
is delayed the delivery and you're going to get the same quantities eventually, the only thing you've lost is the loss of the use of the cash, which could be serious, but which as a uh, seller is not collectible um, as a uh, incidental damage. And you, of course, you've got the cost of the storage. But this is why you need to talk with the OEMs about the additional costs your expense you're incurring. For example, if you had to take additional warehouse space to store the goods. All right, Jim, I'm going to stick with you. Here's a question about the UCC. Does the UCC allow for more or less flexibility in applying the impracticability standards when compared to an express force majeure clause in a situation like this? Um, the And of course, that all depends on the clause itself um, because many of these clauses uh, are very restrictive. Uh, for example, um, when you look at the clauses that are circulating in the industry, it's usually only the buyer that has the right to terminate after a particular time has run under the force majeure, under the force majeure event. Whereas under the UCC, um, it's, it's arguable, uh, at least it's arguable as to whether or not the uh, seller would also have the right uh, to terminate. Um, it's not as specific, but at least you might have more of a more of a right because if the force majeure clause just says only the buyer has the right, um, that that may put you in a more difficult position. But if, for example, this ran for uh, two months, um, we should be you should be talking with your lawyers about the possible use of the force majeure event as an, a a weapon not a weapon, as a negotiating tactic to try to collect some of your costs. Uh, look, I don't have at the end of this period of time, whatever it is, it's unreasonable for me to uh, can, uh, to, me to continue to uh, not deliver. Um, and uh, I have the right to ask for, to terminate and then ask for a new contract with higher prices. Now that is a very difficult argument to make uh, especially if you have a requirements contract, but you never know what a court might buy. So I would consider that. But in general, um, the force majeure is somewhat easier if it has a long list of permitted force majeure events, as opposed to arguing under the uh, impracticability clause 2615, which doesn't provide any examples. You have to go to the comments in order to find examples, and the comments are not uh, part of the law in many of the states. Some states spe specifically recognize comments as part of the law, and others do not. All right, so let's flip that around, and maybe, Sheldon, I'll, I'll ask this of you. Let's take a look at, at the, the, um, the, the company in the situation where it is the purchaser and you have the downstream lower tiers. Um, how does this impact them and what would we recommend, if anything, um, how to handle suppliers if sub suppliers report to us that they are calling for, they're calling a force majeure for, uh, in this event? How do you respond? Should you even respond to a supplier that's saying, hey, force majeure? Um, well, I, I'm going to start by there's a transition between the question of Jim and transition to me. I'll offer a, a more of a different angle than a disagreement with Jim, uh, which is this. Um, traditionally, a common law, the UCC was adopted roughly 60 years, 60 years ago. It varies from state to state. Uh, prior to the UCC, the common law was really quite draconian. And, uh, if, if it wasn't more or less literally impossible to perform, uh, you didn't have an excuse. The on its face, the UCC provision it is not as draconian. You go from possible to impracticable, which is a made up word, um, or at least I've never seen it outside of the UCC section. And especially if you look at the commentary to the UCC, it is soft and cuddly. Let's be reasonable. Let's not be draconian. 
uh, the courts have pretty much ignored soft and, soft and reasonable stuff. And so at a practical level, there's much less difference, I think, between the old draconian rules and the new soft and cuddly rules than, than it appears on, this, on the surface. As to, um, of course, that's not precisely measurable, but I think that fairly captures the big picture. Um, if your supplier claims a force majeure excuse, the question is, what is the force majeure? Of, um, of course, if we, if we were doing this, well, heck, if we were doing this uh, a week ago or so, when I think Jim did do another force majeure webinar, we would have been all taught, we would all been talking about China instead of the United States, and the force majeure event was, I can't get parts out of China. Uh, and so it, it's a it's a question in the first instance it's a question of understanding whether it is a force majeure excuse if hypothetically the force majeure excuse was i have chosen not to make the workers work just as gm has it's a force majeure event uh then everything that jim said as to why it's is just flat out questionable it, it's not clear one way or the other whether what the OEMs did in terms of making a, an HR decision to shut down their plants does or doesn't count as a force majeure event. Any of, any of us could look a judge in the eye and argue either side of, of that question. All right, so looking and, and kind of staying along that path and perhaps sticking with the thought that that we too are, are consumers of other goods and therefore we are, are um, a customer to those suppliers. How frequently should we update our suppliers or even our customers with respect to developments during this crisis? How frequently should we talk to people and notify them where we're at? Do you wanna go first, Sheldon? Um, sure, because I have a short answer. Uh, as frequently as common sense suggests. On the one hand, you don't want your notices to become junk mail. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, when there is something that could have a real commercial impact on either your customers or your suppliers' decision-making and access, uh, then you, you need to keep them updated. The, the UCC itself doesn't really say uh, doesn't really address this in any detail other than the absolute obligation to give the initial notice, but many of the OEM terms do expressly provide for ongoing communication requirements. So yet another way and another reason you really should be your contract term, but in here, good business and good legal protection, I think, are the same. Yes, and uh, the notices really begin, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, before the force majeure event occurs, you have to be forward looking and say, uh, and gathering facts um, to better enable you to react to a force majeure event when it actually occurs. That's why many of you, because we look at what you're doing, many of you are sending notices to your suppliers saying, give us a report, where are you? And trying to work with your suppliers uh, to determine if it's likely a force majeure event will occur at a certain level um, so that you're better able to respond to it. Uh, and, and by the way, one of the things uh, I, I didn't mention, uh, you know, there are uh, plans out there now for uh, adoption in dealing with uh, uh, epidemics and uh, the, the contagious diseases. Um, uh, if you want, you can send me an email. I can send you sample plans. But it, it's going to be very hard. It will be harder for you to be able to declare in your own plant a force majeure event that enables you to stop shipping if you know about the virus and you're not taking any um, steps to protect your workforce or your plant, uh, but somehow you're forced to shut down. Uh, so you need, you can't wait in this environment until you've experienced the force your event or your 
customer has experienced it or your supplier has experienced. You need to have these conversations uh, and gathering of information and developing of contingency plans now in order to protect your rights, to take advantage of your contract clauses uh, and of or the UCC and other areas of the law. I, I'm going right, to make so I, I'm ahead, going to a comment, then, then let Jen take over again. And, and it's for those of you who are sitting here listening and saying, oh, I'm hearing possibly's and maybe's and it's uncertain and et cetera. This is a quote from the leading scholar in this area, J.J. Uh, White from U of M. Quote, it remains impossible to predict with accuracy how the law will apply to a variety of relatively common force majeure cases. Both the cases and the code commentary are full of weasel words. So hopefully we've done better than weasel words, um, but, but, but if not, it's inherent in, in a, a very difficult subject. And to some extent, it's a difficult subject because hard facts don't allow easy answers. Real losses have happened here real harm has happened and there's no perfect answer as to where the losses should lie. And I'll pass it back to you, Jen. And actually, Sheldon, that's a, a very good transition and talking about those real losses and, and um, perhaps a little less force majeure, how should we be dealing with some of those real and incredibly unusual losses? I'll, I'll give one uh, less than hypothetical situation and that's travel expenses where someone may have been in California and might have to stay in a hotel there, for example, um, with self-quarantine because of either preparing to visit a plant or having visited a plant. Um, what about some of those really odd and unusual expenses like self-quarantine that most likely a customer um, is going to say they're not going to pay for? Um, my, my first thought is, is if you're the chairman of Ebenezer Scrooge Inc., you might have a right to not pay for those uh, those hotel expenses. Um, uh, other than that, I, I would be surprised if this ever became a legal issue. But if it did, I would think you were obligated to pay for it. it is It is a reasonable and necessary expense, although reasonable and necessary because of unusual circumstances. Well, Sheldon, here's the question. If you were visiting your customer, as an example, and your customer said, come out, and this, these costs came up, rather than looking at it from the employee to the employer, what about the customer to the supplier? So the question is, would the customer have to pay for your employee to sit in a hotel in California? Yes, I think that's the question. Uh, and uh, what, I've, what I would analogize this to is when your customer is telling you to make a part uh, and you have concerns about whether it will uh, perform, whether it will violate IP of somebody else. Uh, when your customer is telling you something that you believe you have a right not to do because there's some ban on going to California or there's a contractual right, uh, not, or a perceived contractual right not to expose your, your company to damage, um, then you would insist on the indemnification from the customer before you go to send your person out there. The example would be as you, you manufacture the machine, it needs service, you think it can be done by over the phone, otherwise um, you, you, you're just not comfortable sending your personnel out there and they insist on it and somehow it's a big customer and you decide to do it um you know you may ask for a look i'm i'm going to pay but but you're going to if there's any quarantine uh you're going to have to pay those costs and I, I apologize if i misunderstood the question no 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 so here's here's kind of a, a, a here, here's something that would never happen are you ready here's a, a question what if your customer doesn't negotiate with you in good faith on the allocation <laughs> of issues due to force majeure would, would never happen. No, of course not. They're, they're all benevolent. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, do you want to yeah. go first, to go first uh, Sheldon, or you want me to go first? There's, probably an answer. there's no obligation to negotiate in good faith. There, there, there's an obligation to perform your contract in good faith, but you have no good faith obligation to enter into a new deal. And, yeah. Well, at least that's, that's certainly black letter law 
Um, you know, can you find outlayer cases that you know might might vary a little bit from that? Yeah, but but here I you you have a if if the answer is the contract says I have to pick up every nickel of this, but that's just not fair, and my my customer won't agree to modify it. There, there's no good faith obligation. Yes, um, and, and the, where there is the the time, it, 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 as Sheldon just says, when it's black and white, they don't have to pay. The good faith kicks in is when there is a, a an absolute, uh, let's say, discretionary right of the buyer or seller, uh, and that's part of the contract. That discretionary right may have to be exercised in good faith. The example I use in the force majeure uh, context is that if, uh, if if you are able to ship or do something with some slight modification and there is a force majeure event that causes you to modify your performance and uh, it's a practical way of addressing the situation, uh, there is likely a good faith obligation of your of your contracting partner um, to consider uh, your proposed uh, methodology of dealing with a force majeure event. Uh, for example, in 2614, there's a specific provision on transportation where if transportation becomes unavailable, you have the right to use alternative means of transportation. So there are certain times when um, when there's some discretion in one of the parties um, uh, or but there's a specific contract clause like 2614, uh, there is an obligation to deal in good faith with uh, considered alternatives. All right. And now we're we're running a little bit over, two minutes over, according to my clock. I want to uh, thank everyone for joining, but I have one last question um, to, to pose to both uh, Sheldon and to Jim. Um, from the standpoint of both the being a supplier to a customer, and from the standpoint of being a customer to your downstream chain. What is the one thing that everyone should do today in each of those situations? Um, Jim, let's start with you. Yes, and uh, I, I, I think it's the question that was asked and answered, and that is uh, maintaining the communications with all of the stakeholders, uh, which are your suppliers and your um, uh, your suppliers and your customers and communications and be forward looking in your plan. Um, uh, uh, I'll let uh, Sheldon deal with his top item, which is review the contracts. Um, no, actually, I was going to give the exact same answer as you did with the qualification, which is not only should you provide transparency, but you should demand, or at least politely ask for, depending on your leverage, transparency, your own supply chain up, up and down. It's, it's, you know, right now we're in a position of trying to manage a very different and, and uh, communication is key. Okay. And, and from my perspective, and from my perspective, the, the things, the, the, the two things or two thoughts that I have, Number one, just keep an ear out. Um, things change quickly. The Defense Production Act may be invoked and you may be receiving a phone call. If you do, don't panic. And the second thing, if you do decide to diversify, make sure that you're speaking with people because there are a lot of different hurdles depending on the industry that you're going into during these downtimes. So again, I wanna thank everybody for their attendance today. Um, and um, I, I, Jonathan, is there anything else that we need to do? Are we good no, to go? Thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sheldon, Jim, and Jen for the excellent presentation. And thank you all the attendees for attending today's webinar. Um, a copy of this presentation will be made available on Butzel.com on this webinar's event page. Uh, thank you all again. And, uh, have and a great yeah, yeah, you can. And again, you can. If you have questions we didn't get to, uh, you can feel free to email them to us and we'll do our best to uh, answer them. Always. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone, again. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.